it's official. After spy shots, speculation, and leaks, the 2019 Chevrolet Corvette ZR1 formally breaks cover here in Dubai, home of the fast, rich, and fabulous. Yes, this latest iteration shares much of the bones of the Z06 but adds more power, refinement, a giant optional rear wing, and a pledge that this really fast car is for everyone. Even though the new ZR1 has a top speed of more than 210 miles per hour, the Z06 and Camaro ZL11LE still corner the market on crazy. General Motors chose Dubai for the global premiere of the last celebration of the C7 generation Corvette and the return of the ZR1 crown that was applied to the third generation Corvette in 1979, C4 in 1990, and C6 in 2009. We don't do a ZR1 every generation, said Chief Engineer Taj Juector. It's not an automatic. The private unveiling was held a few days before the Dubai Auto Show. Corvette continues to grow in popularity in the fast-growing Middle East, making Dubai a good choice for the global debut, said Tom Peters, Director of Exterior Design for GM Performance Vehicles. The car goes on sale this spring, and GM expects to make 2,000 to 3,000 of them at the plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky, but production will not be limited. Pricing has not been announced but could easily exceed $130,000. The 2009 ZR1 started at $105,000, a carbon fiber package alone added $15,000. The 2018 base Stingray Coupe starts at $56,490 and the Z06 starts at $80,490. Joe Hector said the ZR1 won't be double the price of the Stingray. Many of the suspected details were confirmed. The new coupe continues with GM 6.2-liter pushrod small block V8, but the automaker calls this updated version of the supercharged engine the LT5. It's confusing because the expectation is LT5 would refer to a switch to a DOHC V8. The ZR1 sticks with Corvette's traditional overhead valve, two valves per cylinder. And just when you thought that engine couldn't squeeze out any more power, GM tells us it's rated at 755 horsepower and 715 lb-ft of torque. After driving this around for a while the Z06 feels really sluggish, said Joe Hector. It's a nice exclamation point in the dying embers of C7 before C8 goes mid-engine and DOHC. I've never driven a Corvette like this before, and nobody else has either, because there's never been one like this before, said Mark Royce. Executive Vice President, Global Product Development, Purchasing and Supply Chain. Its unprecedented performance puts all other global supercars on notice that the ZR1 is back. A major difference, this is not the supercharger of the 2009 ZR1 or the 2015 Z06. The Eaton supercharger is 2.9 inches taller with a more efficient intercooled system that Chevy says has 52% more displacement than the Z06 SLT4 supercharger. Cooling has always been a Corvette bugaboo. The heavier supercharger changed the weight distribution so Chevy made the front wheels a half inch wider for more cornering stiffness. Another big difference, GM's first dual fuel injection system. It has primary direct injection and supplemental port injection. A cool byproduct, it is said to shoot flames from the exhaust. The Corvette keeps the 7 speed manual, but buyers can also choose an automatic for the first time in a ZR1 with GM's 8 speed with paddle shift. There was speculation the model could receive GM's new 10 speed co developed with Ford, but Joe Hector said that unit doesn't fit the Corvette architecture and was never designed to. Instead, they updated the 8-speed to shift faster. The ZR1 has the stellar carbon ceramic brakes of the Z06 not the non-ceramic Brembo brakes in the Camaro ZL11 LE1. ZR1 made the right choice, they are among the best on the planet, as we discovered in Motor Trend's best driver's car testing. The look of the most powerful Corvette to date reveals the efforts Chevy has gone to for greater performance. The strip of carbon fiber down the middle of the hood is the cover for the bulging engine that Peters did not want to be any taller so the driver can still sit low in the seat and see over the hood. 
it was a craftsmanship challenge to match the weave of the many pieces of carbon fiber that had to come together. The front clip is all new and the new front fascia has four new radiators which means 13 heat exchangers in total. The front end has almost no fascia, it is almost all openings, Ju Ector said. And the crankshaft has been strengthened. These changes, and the larger supercharger, add about 60 pounds of weight to the car. Curb weight is 3,560 pounds for a car with the most carbon fiber to date. The latest King is designed to perform better on the track with the option to forego the regular low wing for a crazy high wing that produces an estimated 950 pounds of downforce for the track. The adjustable high wing is part of the ZTK performance package and is attached right to the chassis. It can be adjusted about 5 degrees but it's not an automatic adjustment, it requires changing the bolts. Even the low wing generates up to 70% more downforce than the Z06S base aero package, and it's much easier to get at your gear in the back. This is the first vet to get a front underwing to assist with downforce. Historically GM would use front splitters to push the nose down, but balancing the big wing would result in a front that too easily scrapes the ground. Borrowing some race tech, incorporating underwing creates low pressure to keep the car down, said Peters. The ZTK package includes a front splitter with carbon fiber end caps, Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 summer only tires, and tuning of the chassis and magnetic ride control for better cornering grip another area where Corvette needed improvement. And if you like orange, the Sebring Orange design package is, you guessed it, Sebring Orange with matching brake calipers, rocker and splitter accent stripes, seat belts, stitching, and bronze aluminum interior trim. There was a strong customer pull for orange, Ju Ector said. We'll see if they show up with their money. The ZR1 has leather trimmed seats with a suede-like microfiber and an option to make them heated and cooled. Or you can opt for a sport seats and a carbon fiber rimmed steering wheel. Based on all the spy shots out there, the new coupe with a removable hardtop will be quickly followed by a convertible ZR1 with a soft top. We doubt it's a top priority, but the estimated fuel economy is 15-20 seconds mpg in city-slash-highway driving with the manual and 13-23 mpg with the automatic. GM has been getting ready for the 2019 ZR1 as well as the mid-engine Corvette in the works. Production of the 2018 model at the plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky, stopped for three months to retool for future products. TechArt will present its new package for the latest Porsche 911 GT3 at the Essen Motor Show. If you're wondering how someone could improve a modern performance icon like the 911 GT3, learn that TechArt's new Carbon Sport package is basically a body kit, leaving the oily bits unchanged. The new package consists of a lightweight front bonnet that features an integrated air outlet, a front spoiler complete with air blades, winglets, side skirts, a rear wing profile, ram air scoops and a rear diffuser made out of carbon fiber. These parts are designed to replace the original ones or enhance them in the case of the trim pieces. Tech Art is also making available for the latest Porsche 911 GT3 its center locking formula for race 20 inch forged wheels, which can be specified in every way possible, including color match to the brake calipers or the interior decorative stitching. The interior can also be brought to the owner's exact taste as tech art offers tons of options and materials to choose from, such as carbon fiber, leather, alcantara, or lacquered surfaces. Tech art's interior program includes things like color-matched instrument gauges, personalized illuminated door entry guards and much more. The tuner's Type 7 steering wheel can be combined with alcantara, leather, and painted surfaces, offering a 360 mm rim and retaining all the factory features such as multifunction controls, paddle shifts, and steering wheel heating. Say hello to the 2019 Aria FXE, 
a hypercar born and bred in the US that wants to rival the very best from Europe. Unveiled at the LA Auto Show, the car will be offered in two configurations. The first, dubbed the Fay, will use a naturally aspirated 6.2-liter V8 engine. The small company hasn't said how much power this variant will deliver but we know power will be sent through the rear wheels. As for the range topping Aria FXE, it will pair a 720 HP V8 to a pair of axial flux induction electric motors providing an additional 540 HP. This will result in a total of roughly 1150 HP and 1,316 lbft of torque. A 10 kWh lithium-ion battery pack will also be fitted. Aria has yet to choose a transmission to complement the hybrid system but Strac is expected to provide either a 7 or 8 speed dual clutch automatic. Aria claims the FXE will accelerate to 60 miles per hour, 96 km per hour, in a brisk 2.7 seconds and reach a 210 miles per hour top speed. Beyond the powertrain, the vehicle will use a carbon fiber monocoque, a host of carbon body panels, and numerous 3D printed titanium components. Aria intends on selling no more than 400 examples of the FE and FXE and wants to commence deliveries in late 2019. Prices are tipped to start at over $1 million. Remember the Lycan Hypersport? No, don't blame you, only 7 were ever built. But you can watch a video of the 2 million pounds, 242 miles per hour debut model from Dubai based W Motors mooching around here. Now W Motors has revealed the full production version of the Lycan successor, the Fenner Supersport. Much like Tesla, W Motors business plan appears to be based on bringing the price down and increasing the production run with each successive model, because the Fenner is a snip at 1.4 million pounds, and up to 25 of them will be built every year. Okay, not exactly mass production, but heading in the right direction. While the design is all in-house, the Fenner will be built by Magna Steyr in Austria and places a tuned Porsche twin-turbo 3.8-liter flat 6, developed for them by Ruff, just in front of the rear axle. Power and torque is quoted as 789 bhp and 723 pounds foot while it features a full carbon body to keep the curb weight down to 1,350 kg and the performance quite spicy. Like, 0 to 62 miles per hour in 2.7 SECS, 0 to 124 miles per hour in 9.4 SECS and a 245 miles per hour top speed, spicy. Other highlights include carbon ceramic brakes, Porsche's 7-speed dual clutch gearbox, a limited slip differential and an active rear wing with three independent moving sections. Heck, it'll even be offered in both left and right hand drive. So, Porsche innards, European build quality and a set of performance figures that are equally as mental as the design. Question is will 25 customers a year be able to see past that rather hefty price tag? Well, you can't fault the CEO, Ralph R. Debus, optimism. In the official press release he claims the Fenner Supersport is the most incredible car ever produced so far. There you have it then. I'm standing next to what can only be described as a 720 subjected to a state-sponsored doping program. It's swapped beautiful for brutal and soft undulations for jagged voids. Your eyes flit around it, not knowing where to land or what to investigate first. This is what happens when you let engineers, not stylists, design a car. Up until this point, we've known it only by its P15 codename, the second installment of McLaren's Ultimate Series, five years after the P1 rearranged our understanding of the natural world. Now it has a name, the McLaren Senna. Bold move, right, naming it after arguably the world's greatest racing driver? But when you learn that Bruno Senna, Aridan's nephew, has been involved in the development, and its mission statement is to be the company's most focused and effective track car ever, it fits. The brief was quite clear on this car, to make it as fast as we can around a track, but still road legal. It's our fastest car, 
comparable to AP1 around a lap. That's Andy Palmer, line director for the Ultimate Series. The P1 was very much a road car, but focused for the track, while the BP23 will be a Hyper GT, it will take three passengers and luggage over great distances and at incredible speeds. It's all about straight line performance. Ah yes, the BP23. Just to recap, that's the third member of the Ultimate Series, the one we'll see this time next year, the hybrid one with three seats and a revival of the McLaren F1S central driving position, the one that'll cost 1.6 million pounds plus taxes. Every one of the 106 examples are already sold out. It's important to note that neither of these cars, the Senna or BP23, are direct replacements for the P1. They both share the P1's uncompromising philosophy and appetite for speed of course, but fork off in quite different directions. A more obvious replacement for the P1 will come, we're told, but not for another five years at least. Back to the Senna and first things first, it is not a hybrid. You'll find no battery ballast or e-motors here, just a development of the 720SS 4.0 liter twin turbo V8 wound up to 789 bhp and producing 590 pounds foot of torque channeled through McLaren's trusty 7-speed twin clutch box. These are numbers that are no longer startling in the world of 1,400 bhp and hypercars, but when you combine that figure with the Senna's obsessive focus on weight and downforce, its potency grows. McLaren claims a dry weight of 1,198 kg, 85 kg less than the 720s despite packing 79 bhp more. That's 553 bhp per ton for the 720s versus 659 bhp per ton for the Senna, quite some leap. Unfortunately, McLaren hasn't released performance figures for the Senna yet, but let's break out the calculator and do the maths ourselves. Considering the 1395 kg, 903 bhp P1 has a power to weight ratio of 647 bhp per ton, but the Senna has more downforce, we'll assume acceleration figures will be roughly similar. So we're talking 0 to 62 miles per hour in 2.8 SECS, 0 to 124 miles per hour in 6.8 SECS, 0 to 186 miles per hour in 16.5 SECS and a standing quarter mile in 9.8 SECS at 152 miles per hour. Or thereabouts. In terms of lap time our money's on the Senna, with 197 kilograms less to carry around and the latest tire and brake technology to call upon. Turns out there's quite a lot going on under those arches. Bespoke Pirelli P0s, or Trophios as a no-cost option, McLaren's first center locking lightweight wheels and a new breed of carbon ceramic brake discs known as CCMR. Because the material is four times more thermally efficient than previous carbon ceramics, they're actually smaller and therefore lighter. One slight catch, each disc takes seven months of layering and curing to produce. There's also the latest generation of McLaren's race active chassis control 2 hydraulic suspension, that does away with mechanical anti-roll bars thanks to interconnected dampers, and slams the car 50 mm closer to the tarmac in race mode tucking the wheels efficiently behind the arches. It's the aero that sets this car apart. Again, no downforce figures yet, but I'm prepared to stick my neck out here, it should surpass the P1 GTR. That hulk of a rear wing works actively and in tandem with moving flaps in the front intakes, tilting to dial up the downforce, or flattening to bleed it off, depending on steering, brake and throttle position, and speed. From the very front of the car you can follow the path of air particles as they're sucked and smoothed and spat out by the bodywork not just to keep you pinned to the track, but to cool the engine pumping out heat behind your head. That roof snorkel looks mean, but has been tuned so the sound of air rushing in and mixing in the plenum takes care of the high frequencies, while the low notes are provided by the engine via unique mounts that purposefully vibrate the carbon fiber tub. On top of that the extraordinary triple exit titanium and inconal exhaust, positioned to keep the hot gases away from the wing, 
delivers sheer volume to match the violent design. At the very back, the trailing edge is 18 mm lower than a 720s, to keep the air attached as long as possible, while a double decker diffuser made from a single piece of carbon is a thing of intricate beauty to behold and makes the Senna a bugger to parallel park. Those pylon mounts for the wing aren't just for car park points either, it leaves the underside of the wing surface clear so every square centimeter can pull its weight to the interior via dihedral doors that take chunks of the roof with them, like the 720s. Unlike the 720s, the door release is moved to a panel above your head, along with the starter button and race mode selector, and there's a second glazed panel by your knees, so you can stare at the road rushing past when you should be concentrating on where you're going. The seats are thin layers of carbon with foam sandwiched in the middle, then leather or alcantara pads are placed strategically on top. Hit the Christmas pudding a little hard? Not to worry, McLaren will custom fit the seat to each customer. Slide the driver's seat back and forth and a panel housing the gear selector, launch control, and hazard light slides with you, while the 720s retracting instrument panel is carried over unscathed. Behind your head is a glass window separating you from the engine and in front of the that the sum total of the luggage space. It's enough for two helmets, a couple of race suits and possibly a sandwich, Palmer tells us with a grin. And no wonder he's smiling. Starting from the second half of 2018, just 500 Senas will be built, 125 more than the P1, costing 750,000 pounds each. And it's already sold out, a sign of how strong McLaren's customer base now is. We're constantly looking forward, for new technologies, new materials, less weight, more power, says Palmer. But most of all we want a car to be engaging and put a smile on your face. That's why customers want them.